I just got my hands on the brand new A10 Mini Pro and I am super excited to open it up and share with you all of my thoughts about this amazing new device. So let's start with a couple observations about the physical device itself. First of all, it's the exact same form factor as the A10 Mini. It's the same dimensions and it has the same ports on the back. But there is one funny difference, which doesn't really matter, but I just thought it was weird. When I went and swapped out the, the Mini for the Pro on my desk and was unplugging all the cables, I was like, why isn't the ethernet port going in? And then I realized that the port has been turned upside down. I don't really understand what difference that makes. It also doesn't really matter. I just thought it was funny. Another difference, which is really only notable if you have both the Mini and the Pro, is that the power supplies are different. So on the original Mini, the power supply is an 18 watt power supply. On the Pro, it's a 30 watt. And it is actually physically larger as well. So this mostly doesn't matter, but it does mean if you have both, you can't just leave your power supply and wire running and then swap out the minis. You actually have to have two separate power supplies for them. Don't try to power the Mini Pro from the smaller supply of the A10 Mini. But other than that, that's really the only physical differences. They do have the same ports, so there's still the four HDMI in, one HDMI out, two audio ins, and then the USB-C and the ethernet. There's still, unfortunately, no headphone jack. I would have loved if they had included the headphone jack in this, but I guess that wasn't in the cards today. Okay, so onto the fun stuff. So the main new features I was excited about was the ability to record to USB drives, the ability to live stream directly from the device, and of course, the multi-view. Everybody has been asking for the multi-view feature in the original A10 Mini. That way you can see all of your angles at the same time and know what they're all showing. Personally, I actually don't think it's necessary for a lot of applications. I think it's totally fine to just know what your shots are gonna be and switch to them when they're ready. For fixed cameras and a single operator, that's actually a lot easier to deal with. But in the case that you are either running a show for somebody else or trying to do more complicated stuff where you need to preview titles or effects or green screens, the multi-view functionality gives you that preview output as well as the program, and that is actually really cool. I also absolutely love these other features they added into the multi-view thing, which even some of the more expensive ATEMs don't have. So as you can see, the multi-view shows us all four inputs. I've got my main camera, my camera that you're watching from here, I've got my computer as one of the inputs, as well as this HyperDeck player so I can play some test clips off of it. It also shows you what's in the graphics pool. And then these are the three new ones that it, they added, which are just super cool. So it actually shows you the status of your stream. So you can see the bit rate it's streaming at and how well the cache is doing. It'll also show you your hard drive status and recording status onto your drives and your audio meters for each input as well. So let's talk about these one by one, starting with recording. So in the announcement video, they were talking about being able to record to both solid state drives as well as USB drives, which is super awesome. They also showed using the Blackmagic multi-dock that gives you four hard drive slots in a rack mount to be able to plug in multiple drives into the A10 Mini Pro. That's super cool and all, but that device is also $600 and I'm not about to buy a $600 USB hub if I don't need it to also be rack mount. I was curious if I could use a generic USB hub and just plug in multiple drives off of that. And the good news is it works great. Here I have just a little cheap USB-C hub from Anchor with three USB ports on the top and a USB-C connector. And I'll go ahead and plug in an SD card reader with an SD card in it, as well as a USB thumb drive into this hub. By the way, can I just say how much I love this thing? It's a thumb drive with regular USB on this side and USB-C on the other side. So it's perfect for this kind of thing where you're plugging it into either a hub or the back of the A10 Mini, and then your computer, either the regular USB or USB-C. Anyway, I just thought that thing was great, so I had to share. Let's now plug this into the A10 Mini Pro. And we wait a few seconds, and now we can see that both hard drives appear ready to record directly from the A10 Mini Pro. And that is just super fantastic that it's that flexible. It can handle a solid state drive, as well as an SD card or a thumb drive. But what I was really curious about, when using multiple drives, you can actually hot swap them and switch recording from one drive to the other without stopping. So I wanted to test if this would drop any frames when it switches from recording from one drive to the other. So to test this, I've got a clip loaded in this HyperDeck player and it actually has a counter at the bottom which ticks up one number every frame. So it's just showing time code and what that'll let us do is see when we review the clips that we record, which is the number that it ends at and which is the number that the next clip starts at. So switch to that. You can see the numbers are ticking up here now. And I'm gonna go ahead and hit record. Let that run for a few seconds. You, we can see it's recording to the first drive. And then I'm going to switch recording by holding this button down. And now it's switch drives. And when I stop the recording and review it, 
we should be able to look on the computer and see if any frames are dropped. So I'll go ahead and stop recording, stop playing the clip, and let's take a look at the recording. So we can see the two drives are plugged in here. Let's go ahead and open this one and the other one from the second drive. Let me put these side by side. And now as we scrub from this first clip, we get to, we can see it ends right at 1453. And sure enough, the very next frame of the next clip is 1454. So we can see it lost zero frames when it swapped over and both clips are recorded perfectly. Frankly, I just think that's incredible. So that is awesome. One of the other really cool things is that it can actually record to both Mac and PC formatted drives. So if you look at my screen, I've actually got both an XFAT formatted drive and a Mac OS formatted drive. And it can actually recognize both of these just fine, which is again, super cool that you don't have to deal with really thinking about what format it's in. Okay, one last thing about recording. This one's a little bit weird. So it turns out there's only one encoder in the device, which means if you're streaming and recording, then you're recording the same exact format that you're streaming, which I understand the limitation there. It basically means there's only one hardware encoder in there and you're not recording different bit rates. And I actually think that's perfectly fine because honestly, a stream is high enough quality these days that recording that is also just fine. The one sort of weird thing about setting this up is that in order to actually choose what bit rate you record, you have to actually go into the live stream option and choose the quality here. So that means if you wanna record the highest quality, you should go into the live stream option, choose Hyperdeck High, and that'll record the highest bitrate option onto your drive. Technically, you can also stream this quality, but you're gonna saturate your internet connection real quick that way. So if you are gonna be streaming and you want a local copy, you probably wanna switch down to about half of what your maximum upload speed is. And then when you record, that's the resolution recorded. And we can verify this by looking at the remaining record time when we choose this bitrate. So you can see when I choose streaming low, I've got 61 hours of record time available on this USB drive. If I switch this up to the highest setting, it drops down to just four hours. So again, you can see that by choosing your streaming quality, you are affecting the record time remaining because those two things are linked. I do think it'd be nicer if this particular thing were pulled out separately in this interface because it does affect both the quality streaming and recording. All right, now moving on to streaming. So this was something I was super curious about when I first heard this could stream directly to the internet. Sometimes some companies hard code a list of streaming services that are supported into the software and you can't change it. I'm looking at you, Webcaster X2. So I was really hoping this device was not gonna do that. Thankfully, they did actually cover this in the announcement because I'm sure everybody wanted to know this. So in the software, you get this little drop down where you can choose which platform to stream to. Now it ships with just Facebook, Twitch, and YouTube configured. This part is a little bit confusing. So this software control interface gives you a place to put in the stream key, which is great because you're probably gonna wanna switch that out when you're switching to different YouTube events or things like that. The weird thing is there is no interface, at least as of right now, to customize this. Instead, you have to go edit an XML file which I know sounds scary, but it's not that bad, I promise. So the first thing you're gonna wanna do is go find that file. The easiest way to do that is gonna to be to go to Finder, click Go, go to Folder, and then type in this whole path. It'll actually autocomplete if you just wait a couple seconds after each key press. So slash library, slash app location support, slash Blackmagic design, and hit Go, and that's gonna open that folder. In here, there's a folder called Switchers, and in that, there's a file called streaming.xml. This is the file you're gonna to wanna to edit. Now, it doesn't matter what program you use to edit it, but I like to use Sublime Text. Again, any text editor will work just fine. So you can just go open with Sublime Text or your text editor of choice, and it will open that file. Now, if you look at this file, there's a couple of interesting things here. It's broken up into these sections called services. And if you collapse them, you'll see that there's our three, Facebook, Twitch, and YouTube. So that means if we wanna add a new service, we can basically just copy one of these ones and replace the values. So let's go ahead and take this YouTube chunk, copy it down below, and let's set this up for restream. So let's call it restream.io. And then you'll notice that there's some things in here like a ser different servers and then profiles. So we need to go find the RTMP URL for restream.io. So go ahead and go into your account under streaming setup, 
there it'll show you the restream.io link. We're gonna copy that and we're gonna paste it in here. Now, it looks like they don't give you more than one, so we'll just delete the secondary. These are the bitrate options you'll get in the ATEM software control to choose from, and you can actually customize these if you want. The defaults are probably fine. It's got a high, medium, and low. We'll just leave the defaults and go ahead and save this file. Now, it's probably gonna ask you for your system password because this file is owned by the system, not by your user account. So it'll ask you to type in your password for your computer. Go ahead and do that and hit save. If you're on Windows, it's the same process, except the file is in a different location. I will leave that down here since I don't remember it off the top of my head right now. Okay, so this is broken into two parts. This file lives on your laptop that's running the software control app. It doesn't actually go into the switcher at all. This is the part that threw me for a minute. This file is deciding what options will appear in the software control interface. From the software control interface, once you choose one of them, you choose a platform, a server, and enter a key, those three particular values get pushed into the ATEM Mini itself. And only one of the options will actually live in the device. So that does mean if you have multiple computers and you configure streaming services on one computer, those don't automatically get copied over to the other computer because only the one streaming service configured to the Mini is living in the Mini itself. Okay, so once you've saved that, we actually need to now restart the software control app to get it to read that file again. So go ahead and do that. Quit software control, relaunch, and now we should see restream IO in the list. That's funny, apparently you can't use dots in the name. So there's only one server configured, and again, the key is not saved in that configuration file because that's just choosing which options will display in this list. Now I can go ahead and get my stream key from restream, paste it in there, and now I'm ready to roll. As soon as I do that, it is then saved into the ATEM Mini, and I can now use the hardware button to go on air. So I am now pushing to restream, and you can see that it's working because this will actually start blinking if the internet connection goes away. So if I just yank out the ethernet port, then in a couple seconds, it's gonna start blinking when it realizes it has no internet connection, and it'll start buffering instead. So we can see it's now disconnected and the cache is still, it's still writing into the cache, which is super cool. That means that even if you lose your internet connection for a while, it's actually still recording internally for a little while. And eventually when it comes back online, it can start playing back from the cache instead of skipping to wherever you are now, which means your viewers won't see a big jump when you come back online. Now we can see here, the cache is filling up. It's at 50%. And if I go back online, then it will start streaming again, give it a second to find the internet connection. Boom, it's reconnected to the internet and now it's able to flush the cache and we are back online. Okay, so again, to recap, the services that appear in the dropdown are saved onto your computer, not into the switcher itself. Only the one active stream is saved into the switcher. Once you've set it up, however, you can then actually stream directly from this without it being connected into the computer at all. So because I do a couple of totally unrelated projects with the switcher, running shows for different people and a few different shows for myself, I end up wanting to save settings so I don't have to worry about reconfiguring everything and getting my picture-in-picture -picture windows set up every time. So you can actually save the entire state of what's configured in the, in the switcher into an XML file. So if we go up to File, click Save As, and give this a name like Test Show, go ahead and save that. You can see it's gonna save all these settings. Now, if you do actually want to save an entire snapshot, then you would leave all the things checked. And that's going to save all of your media in the media pool. It'll save your different audio levels and everything goes into this file. Hit save. And this is going to produce a giant XML file, which we can then open up here. And as you can see, there's a lot of stuff in this file. It can be really fun to open this up and see what's inside and tweak things. This is also a great way to fine tune your macros. So when you're recording a macro, if you wanna make a really nice slow audio fade, you can go ahead and do that by editing the XML file, which is a lot easier than doing it by hand in the interface. But the other really cool thing is that this file also includes your streaming settings. So if you go look at the bottom, we've got that restream that I just typed in. I've got now, you can see on the device, it's saved the name, the RTMP URL, and the streaming key. So that's actually now baked into the ATEM Mini, and it's in this XML file. So if I want to create a bunch of different profiles for different shows, I can save the configured service and the URL and the stream key into the XML file as well. So you can then restore those settings from the XML. So you can then create a bunch of different XML files for your different shows with the different stream keys configured for each, 
and then restore from each XML file when you're ready to go, and it will also restore the streaming settings. The one sort of weird thing about that is that if this service name does not appear in your machine's streaming.xml file, then back in the ATEM interface, it will actually show up as just blank. I think it still works fine, but you won't be able to change any of those settings unless there's a matching entry in the streaming.xml file, which is the one that lives on your computer running the software control interface. I apologize if that was a little bit too in the weeds, but I thought that was really interesting, and that was one of the things that threw me off when I was first learning about this, so I figured I would share it. The important thing to remember is that you want to edit your streaming.xml file on your computer in order to add a custom streaming endpoint, and then you can go enter a stream key, save it in an XML file to save the state of the entire switcher, and then restore your different shows from those files. One of the other funny things I noticed is that when I reach my hand over here, this is noticeably warmer than the A10 Mini. It's like putting out a lot of heat. I guess it's just also doing a bunch more stuff, so that's why they had to bump up the power supply, but it's like noticeably warmer. It's still really quiet. I think there is a tiny fan in it now, but it it's honestly way quieter than my laptop fan, so it's just really not a problem at all. Make sure you stick around to the end if you want a quick tour of everything I've got on this desk here, and I'll show you how it's all connected. So those are just a few of my first impressions of using this device after just a couple of days. I'm definitely planning on making more videos about this device, so if you have any questions, leave a comment down below, and I will make sure I address those in a later video. If you're thinking about buying one of these, please do use my affiliate links down below. They really help out this channel. I have a link down to the DVE store, which is where I got mine from. This video is not sponsored by them, but they were nice enough to overnight it to me as soon as they had it in stock, so I really appreciate that from them. So thanks so much for watching, and stick around for the behind the scenes tour of this setup. Welcome back, congrats on making it this far. I'm gonna show you a quick tour on how I made this video. If this is something you like, please do let me know in the comments and I'll do this for every video. I think it's kind of fun. So this camera, my main camera, is the GH5S with the Leica 15mm f1.7 lens. I love this combination. It's great for these kinds of shots. It's about arm's length away from me and I could just reach out and touch the lens. This camera, the side view, is a Sony RX0. It's just a tiny little thing and I love it because it's so small and I can just put it anywhere. Both of these are running HDMI cables into the A10 Mini Pro itself. I have this external monitor for my computer up here. This is connected to one HDMI port on this little USB-C dongle. I have a second USB-C dongle attached to my laptop, which is running into the A10 mini, and that's what you're seeing on input three here. My iPad's plugged in also just as another video source just for fun to fill up that spot. For audio, I'm using the Samson C02 microphone. It's an XLR microphone with the cable running down to the zoom in the back there. That's an external recorder where I'm recording audio. It's then feeding the audio back into the camera. Normally, I also use this monitor up here as the program out or now multi-view out from the A10 Mini Pro. However, for whatever reason, this monitor does not work with the Mini Pro. It works fine with the original Mini, just not with the Mini Pro. So I think I'm just gonna return it and get another one because I don't wanna deal with that. It wasn't even that expensive to begin with. In order to actually capture the multi-view that you're seeing, I'm running that into an HDMI recorder. So the output from the A10 mini is actually running into this Blackmagic recorder, which is also a secondary monitor, and then it goes out into the larger monitor over here so that I can have it in the shop. This thing is capturing it onto an SD card where I can then edit into the show later. Also on my desk here was a Blackmagic HyperDeck Studio Mini. That is a part of the rack mount kit that I normally use at gigs which I'm obviously not doing anymore, but I am now repurposing this to play live video clips when I'm actually doing talks at conferences now. I can play recorded clips of myself fed into the A10 Mini as one of the inputs. One of the really cool things about the A10 Mini is that it actually does know about the HyperDeck. So you can set it up so that when you switch to one of the inputs on the Mini, it actually tells that to start running the clip. So you can have a perfectly seamless cut of, hey, uh, welcome to the event. I'm gonna start the recording now, hit go, and it just runs. So in this video, we were using it to run that counter so they could see if any frames were dropped in the recording on the SD card. I'll save the rest of this for a proper studio tour video. This was just a little sneak peek of behind the scenes, but I wanted to really just focus on what was connected into the A10 Mini so you got a sense of how I'm doing that there. So that's the quick behind the scenes tour. Thanks again for watching, and I will see you in the next one.